All right, thank you. Do you hear me? All right, so good evening. It's really a pleasure to be here. I, I don't often get to talk to people from so many different countries, which you hardly see in Israel, so this is really a nice opportunity. I, um, I'm not going to give you a crash course uh, and compress a year into two hours. So, so actually, uh, the story I want to, to tell you is really about um, some recent relatively new uh, theory, which is not even completely or published at all. And um, it's, uh, it has to do with better understanding of deep neural networks. So I know you all heard a little bit about deep learning, and, but not that many of you actually do deep learning. I mean, very few. And uh, just to calibrate my, my, my level of expectation, so first of all, I'm going to talk slowly at first, but I really want you to follow me. So whenever I say something you don't understand or a concept that you don't recognize, raise your hands. I really want you to be with me, even if I get a lot less material. So uh, ask questions during the talks. That's important. Uh, so as you know, I'm sure you all know that uh, AI, I mean, what you call artificial intelligence, uh, is really a process that has very clear three different phases. Uh, <clears throat> the first one uh, started really with Turing, uh, with the idea that uh, our brain is nothing more than a Turing machine and that uh, intelligence is essentially some very clever algorithm that runs in our brain. Yeah. So not all of you may buy this, but this was the starting point <clears throat> of what we now call AI. And actually the first phase of uh, artificial intelligence between the 50s and, and the 80s uh, 40 years of, of 30 years of uh, essentially what you may call now the naive AI, or, or, or it was really based on logic. I mean, the, the idea that people had at that time, mainly computer scientists, uh, is that uh, in order to program an intelligent Turing machine or intelligent machine, uh, all you need to do is to ask an ex expert, I mean, how do you do things, and then program the rules, essentially. So the idea was... Uh, as naive as it sounds today, I'll ask you, how do you see? You'll tell me, and I'll program it. <laughs> I'll ask you, how do you walk, or how do you speak, or how do you understand language, or how do you do whatever you do? And of course, since you do it, you know how to do it. I mean, and all you need is just a, a list of commands that will tell us what to do, and we'll program it. This was the, the, the naive AI, as I call it today. I mean, it was all based on logic, I mean, essentially, Everything is either true or false. There are no intermediate phases in anything. I mean, these are mathematicians that come from uh, the, 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 um, the old computer science where probabilities were considered out of the game. <laughs> we do logic. Now, uh, as, as, as I'm sure you know, I mean, so expert systems were essentially big lookup tables. I mean, they were, I mean, in this condition, do this. In this condition, do this, and so on. <laughs> Just a big, a big list of commands. Uh, you know, even for doctors who, who, who diagnose diseases, I mean, who are supposed to be experts in what they do, I mean, this approach is wrong. <laughs> I mean, no one can tell you exactly what you do. I certainly not list it in a, in a long list of commands. And, and this naive AI, I mean, expert system or lookup tables, obviously today, <laughs> but in, in retrospect, failed. I mean, it didn't, didn't bring us too far. I mean, you know, the, the state of the art, I mean, in the 60s or early 70s even, there were people, really the leaders of artificial intelligence, like, like Marvin Miski at MIT or others, who thought that, you know, computer vision is really a very high, easy problem. We'll give it as a summer project for two graduate students and certainly solve the problem of how, do, how we see or how we, object, how we recognize objects and so on. This was really the state of the art until the 80s. Now, in the 80s, more or less in the early 80s, 1982, 1983, 1984, uh, there was really a big shift which we, from what we call artificial intelligence to what we can call today machine learning. And machine learning is, is all about statistics, as you all know. I mean, so essentially, Forget these logic machines that, have, that know everything and have only a true and false values to variables. Uh, think about probabilities. And 
so it took machine learning, it takes artificial intelligence from, from this logic phase to the statistics phase, which was essentially about uh, inf inference from probabilities of, of from uncertain data, the rules, and instead of actually programming the rules by asking an expert, we learn the rule by essentially accumulate data, and the program is not on the rule itself, but on what we call now the learning rule, or the meta rule. I mean, so the machine is now designing or, or generating or learning or estimating, whatever you want to call it, inferring some sort of a model. And this model has usually parameters, or you know, if it's not too large, sometimes, sometimes you call it non-parametric. But in principle, instead of learning the rules, we learn a class of possible rules and then just adjust parameters. Now, this was machine learning, it, it, so it moves from logic to statistics. And, and this was essentially, actually, in the, early eight, 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 in the early 80s, 82, 83, 84, I was still at PhD students then. Uh, there were two seminal papers that really influenced the field tremendously. One of them was in 1982, I think, or three or four, no, two, uh, by Les Valiant. No, I think it was 84. Uh, a very prominent computer scientist who, who wrote a very elegant, clean paper called the a Theory of the Learnable, which was essentially focused the attention on this from lookup tables or from sensory list of rules to what we call generalization today. I mean, do outside of the training data, and can we actually find some rigorous, as much as possible, distribution independent bounds on generalization, on the error outside of the training error. This is something I'm going to talk a lot about today. This was one very important paper because I think it, it essentially brought machine learning or, or brought statistics from engineering departments, which, who did it a long time ago, I mean, estimation of parameters and things like this, to computer science. The other interesting paper, which many of us forget, but for me at least was very important, was in 1984, uh, uh, Hoffield model. I mean, John Hoffield introduced a neural network model, which I'm going to mention at some point, of memory, of associative memory, which had a, a very interesting flavor. It was some sort of an energy landscape with attractors that could take, eventually, after learning from random patterns or random introduction of patterns through something which we now call the Hebrew, or some sort of synaptic uh, connections which are getting stronger or weaker depending on the data, it generates an energy function, and then eventually the recognition or the memory phase is just the dynamics into local attractors of this energy function. This was very appealing, especially to physicists, because it looks very much like uh, you know, a Hamiltonian system with some sort of uh, uh, multiple minima, and, and both the dynamics and the study of the space of these connections and so on really introduce a, a flurry of activity in the 80s and early 90s on the statistical physics of neural network and eventually on statistical physics of learning. And that's later on in the late 80s. I was a postdoc, and not a postdoc anymore. I was at Bell Labs at the time. And, and Bell Labs within 85 and 92, 93, 94 was really the best place in the world to think about machine learning because things were happening there. You know, just corridor, corridor meetings on daily basis were really fascinating because we heard a lot both from biologists who were interested in that, from engineers and mathematicians and physicists, all of them thought about the physics and, and, and mathematics of, of uh, neural networks and, and learning in general. And for me, I mean, I came from physics, uh, from statistical physics and dynamical systems in my PhD. This was a very attractive field, and, and we start to thought, think about, about um, large-scale machines. And again, I'll talk a lot about it, about what they mean by large-scale. And, and why is it so important? But this was the late 80s, you know, 80, between 86 and 92. This is really the golden age of this, of this field of statistical physics of, uh, of, of learning and statistical physics of neural network. Then eventually, it went out and decayed. And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, this thing became relevant again in the, in the third phase of what I call the third phase of AI, which is from the late 2000s Till now, I'm still very much into in, in the hype of this phase, which, which we call deep learning. So neural network came back. And neural network came back in, in a very interesting way, I mean, in some sense. So 
they came back, essentially, they came back to the very original idea that, that Rosenblatt, um, Frank Rosenblatt, in the, in the late 50s and early 60s already introduced this, this notion of multi-layer systems, very much in the spirit of what we're now using as deep learning. He called it perceptrons, but he thought about multi-layer perceptrons. So I'm sure you all heard about one-layer perceptron, but essentially what Rosenblatt thought was he knew already, already in 1959, that one-layer perceptron cannot do much. It's, it's only linearly separable data in some sense. You can separate it with a hyperplane. So he already thought about many, many layers. The problem here was that, although I, th I think he was actually re well aware of it, if you read his book today, you find it really very revealing how much he already understood. But again, the irony of history that in the, in the el late early 70s, actually, two of his colleagues, uh, again, Ma Marvin Minsky and, and, and Pepper, did, both from MIT at the time, wrote this wonderful, rigorous book called Perceptrons, which essentially argued you know, very convincingly <laughs> that those multi-layer systems cannot be trained. And they, not that they didn't think about something like stochastic gradient or gradient descent, and back propagation, as we call it today, but they ruled it out immediately in the book as something which is going to get stuck in local minima very quickly and therefore has no chance of actually working. And surprisingly, this, uh, this uh, dominant uh, uh, argument, uh, although, as I said, completely rigorous and entirely wrong in, in, in terms of the conclusions, uh, 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 killed the, air, the field essentially until the, the 80s where you know, mainly psychologists like Rummelhart and Hinton and, 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 and others, and Teresinovsky and a few others who were in this PDP group, essentially revived it, and that's exactly what started the whole thing of neural network in, the, in this recreation of what we now call the connectionist time in the 80s. And then surprisingly, the whole thing went down again in the 90s, essentially due to the work of one person, Vladimir Vapnik, who came from the, the, the Russia at that time with, with essentially re-bringing re, re some old statistical ideas that he developed actually in the 70s and, and uh, eventually brought it back or took neural network into a very interesting phase which we now call kernel methods or support vector machines <laughs> which are essentially two layer, two hidden layer neural network but very rigorous and crisp bounds on the, on the performance and all this notion of margin and, and generalization, generalization boundaries are really very elegant. And, uh, and during the 90s, mostly in the 90s until the mid 2000s, the whole field of neural network was out of the game. I mean, you know, people at NIPS could not write papers with neural network in the abstract because this would mean uh, reject immediately or something like this. It was really the case. I was there. Now, surprisingly, as I said, in the late 2000s, some of those stubborn guys like uh, Ian Lacoon and, and Jeff Hinton and some of the students eventually brought it back. But they brought it back in this form of very deep networks. I mean, many, many layers. And there was not, it wasn't, wasn't exactly clear why, why this should make any difference. I mean, we already had theorems that told us that a few layers or even one hidden layer is enough in principle. But we knew that the computational complexity is very hard for one hidden layer. But it wasn't really clear why putting many layers, and now we are talking about really many layers, thousands or even 10,000 layers in the, in the modern machine, why this should make a difference, but it made a difference. And uh, eventually, in the late 2000s, those deep neural networks, which are nothing more than the original Frank Rosenblatt perceptron, but trained with back propagation or with stochastic gradient descent, uh, started to win every competition in pattern recognition, starting from image recognition, and then speech recognition, and then uh, uh, many other problems, essentially. And of course, there's all sorts of variations, where maybe the most sophisticated ones are what we call deep uh, RL, and, and uh, deep reinforcement learning, or deep, uh, deep uh, system with feedbacks, and so on. So essentially, this element of deep neural network is now at the core, essentially, with no real competition of every, maybe there are different networks or different pieces of the network. There can be an actor network, a, a, a controller network, or whatever. In our RL, there can be many other things, but this is the universal learning device today, with all sorts of variations, which I'm going to mention later on, like what we call ResNets, or, or skip connections, uh, and, and, and so on. So there are variations on this theme. Some of them are very interesting, but conceptually, this is the game now. Okay, so this is, it sounds very good because 
in, in a real sense, it's brought AI back to life. I mean, so AI in this deep learning phase is doing better than ever. And uh, suddenly things which I thought will never happen, like continuous real-time online speech recognition, speaker independent, like we, do, we all do with Siri and Google speech and so on. Or, or uh, I mean, I worked on speech recognition for, for, for some time in the 80s, and I thought this is going to be a very hard problem. I'm not going to see it in my lifetime. Or very, very satisfying object recognition or face recognition. You know, so this, these deep networks are now uh, everywhere, whether you like it or not. And they are taking over things like control, I mean, driving autonomous cars, or, or, uh, or controlling uh, uh, large-scale uh, diseases, or communication, and whatever. So <laughs> it sounds very nice. This was actually a very big surprise to a lot of people. I mean, so essentially, you heard about it uh, at least yesterday, but I'm sure you know about it. So essentially, the idea is really very simple. You just put the, the image or the, the, the pattern at the beginning, you look at the output, and then you backpropagate the error layer by layer using the chain rule of derivatives. And eventually, you, and you adjust slowly uh, small changes of the weights of, of those connections between the layers. I don't have to explain what the neurons are. I mean, those are linear threshold functions with weights. I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. And eventually, this uh, really very naive algorithm, just gradient descent, and you don't even calculate the gradient exactly. You calculate the noise diversion of the gradient because of something I'm really going to get into very carefully later on. So it's something like the stochastic optimization problem that Bert, Bert just talked about, about, but it's not really because the gradients, the noise is not, is not uniform, and it's state dependent and so on. But, uh, but there are many, many uh, interesting things there, which, which uh, and, and somehow it works beautifully. I mean, uh, we, are, we are getting to human performance, let's say, on object recognition, or better, we are getting to human performance on, on speech recognition, we are getting to human performance on some control problems and so on. So this is... This calls for a theory. OK. So OK, I just want to mention again that the neuron itself is this very simple linear threshold function, which means I'm actually taking, let's call them the inputs or the features of the previous layers, the output of the previous layer, multiply them by some vector of weights. There's always what we call the bias or, or the, the offset term, which is very important because it tells me where the zero is. And actually, it has a, a different scale. I mean, it scales like all the other layers and weights together. But this dot product is essentially just going through some sort of nonlinearity, which in most, in the original cases, was a sigmoidal nonlinearity, this uh, saturated uh, sign, smooth sign function. Today, we're actually using things like ReLUs, or what we call piecewise linear functions, which essentially give us very simple derivatives. I mean, think about ReLUs. It has only two values of derivatives, 0 and 1. So it's a very crude a very crude derivative uh, function. And, and, uh, and this still works very well, actually better than many other things. So the question I'm going to discuss in this series of talks, I, I never had so, long so much time, so I really want to try to do it slowly. So I'm, in the first lecture today, I'm going to discuss learning, statistical learning theory, what I call the old statistical learning theory, which is essentially the valiant, what we call PAC models, or probably approximately correct bounds. How many of you heard about them? Well, very few. So I'm going to talk about it slowly. And uh, the pack bounds, usually physicists never hear about it. Uh, some computer scientists do. But so, so, and, and I'm going to modify, I'm going to eventually modify this bound and argue why they are not suitable for this type of learning. And this is what I call rethinking learning theory. So how much, how much a large scale learning rate really ch should change our classical view of things? So this is the, the classical pack bound. I'm going to introduce something we already knew in, in, in the 80s, which are distribution-dependent bounds. I, I argue that once you really want to go beyond pack bounds, and I, I'm going to argue that pack bounds are essentially useless, and they get more and more useless the larger the problem becomes, because the worst case cannot be controlled. It's too, it's too far away. So you need to control some sort of typical case. So I'm going to argue a lot about this typical behavior. What do we mean by typicality? What, I, what do I mean by typical learning problem, and why this is enough? This is going to take me, OK, again, I'm going to talk about it in some sense in, in, in the thermodynamic limit. This is something I, I, tell to, I tell physicists. I mean, for the same reasons exactly that statistical physics is so useful uh, in, in, uh, in a modeling large-scale system. But you know, the large scale there is the Avogadro number, I mean, the number of particles in, in, your, in, your, in, your, 
glass of water or whatever it is, uh, the number of molecules, this is really large, but I'm going to argue that even in, in a much smaller numbers, order of 10 actually, <laughs> order of 100, uh, this, this uh, large, large, large uh, limit, uh, large and limit is, is already becoming very important. It's going to dominate the story completely, even for very small networks. And this is going to take me to, to this, uh, I, I, need, I need a lot of concepts that some of you may know, like entropy in the shell sense, or mutual information, or KL divergences. So I just wonder, again, just to know, how many of you know what mutual information is? Okay, all of you. How many know what the uh, rate distortion function is? Not sure. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so uh, this, uh, this gives me the scale. So, so I, and how many know why entropy is so important? I mean, the, the typicality, the, what we call the asymptotic equipartition theorem. How many heard about it? Okay, so I'm somewhere in between. <laughs> I know that you heard about mutual information, but you don't really know how is it used. <laughs> in information theory. Okay, that's the state of the art, that's good. So I'm going to spend today some time motivating, I'm not going to give you a crash course in information theory, this will take too long, or it will be too compressed. <laughs> and as you know, there is a trade of compression and understanding. So uh, I'm going to be, go slowly, talk about the entropy, and talk about mutual information, and talk about the KL divergences, and why they're so important. And then I'm going to go to my main uh, new result here, which I call the information plan theorem which is essentially trying to argue that when you start to talk about very large systems, somehow, surprisingly, the, the very complex system of tons of parameters, millions of weights, uh, actually is actually reduced to two numbers, which are really important. So this is very similar in spirit to equilibrium thermodynamics, where you know that eventually it's a trade-off between two functions, the energy and the entropy of the system, and if you know this, you can calculate whatever you want. If you know what trade-off is, so something very similar, but still different, <laughs> happens here, in my opinion. And this is the, the two values of information, which are going to be important for the rest of the discussion. This is, and, this is, and I'm going to talk about uh, the behavior of neural networks in this plan and motivate the questions of the next, to of the next part, which is tomorrow morning, which is after we understand what's going on in uh, in, in, in this information theoretic view of the neural networks, I'm going to bring dynamics back. So actually, I argue that information functions alone cannot really give you the really interesting story because they are invariant, they are too invariant to permutations or to run-to-one -one transformations of the variable. They're completely oblivious to them. Therefore, I can actually encode, in the information plan alone, I don't see the computational complexity at all. It's not there. In order to see what happened in time, I need to go back exactly to the topics that Bert and maybe others discussed here, which is this uh, stochastic training dynamics. And uh, in particular, what we, which we call stochastic gradient descent, or SGD, and I'm going to argue again in the spirit of the Fokker-Planck equation, whatever you want, that there are usually two terms in, those, in this dynamics, a drift term and a diffusion term, but they are completely imbalanced in, in the first part of the training, the drift the drift is completely dominating the story, and in the second part of the training, which happens very quickly, actually, after a few epochs of training, the diffusion dominates the story. So most of the training of deep neural networks, according to this view, is happening due to the diffusion or the random walk of these uh, winner processes that, that happens to the weights when you, when you train them with stochastic dynamics. And I'm going to prove... Uh, I'm going to show you some very nice, interesting, uh, to prove or to at least numerically convince you that this, these are, there are indeed two phases to the dynamics. One of them is mostly drift, and the other one is mostly diffusion. We're going to look at the, at the way the weights scale with time. And as physicists, you'll immediately recognize it. I mean, linear dynamics is going to have a linear, linear growth of the weights, and diffusion is going to have the square root of t type of growth of the weights, because it's a random walk. And, and this is very clearly observed in all the networks we looked at. But by the way, a lot of people could see this has nothing to do with any information processing or anything. And then I'm going to prove a, a bound, which I call the Gaussian, Gaussian bound on, on the mutual information. And I'm going to use, again, concepts from information theory. And for this, I need the concept of a Gaussian channel, which I'll discuss slowly and introduce here. So 
This is going to give us a very interesting bond on the mutual information between two successive layers of the network. And then I'm going to, to give you really one of the highlights of the theory, which is the theorem about the, the computational benefit of the layers. So if this is true, that everything is dominated by diffusion, then here is suddenly a good explanation, or at least an explanation I like, why many layers help you. I'm going to prove that in this case, the time that it takes to converge to good solution actually goes down with the number of layers, which is very surprising and very non-intuitive. Uh, so this is going to be the end of my second talk. And the third talk, hopefully, I'm going to, to elevate the whole thing to a much deeper physics, if you want. I'm going to, to start asking, OK, so if this is the story, where are these layers really? What do they represent? I mean, in some sense, what do they tell us? Do, do they have any differences? What do, what is the, the, this is what I call opening the black box. I mean, what do these layers actually encode? And uh, I'm going to use a, a little bit of group theory and uh, phase transition understanding and so on in order to really give you some sort of insight. This is completely new and unpublished, but I still give it for free. Okay, no problem. <laughs> now, so when you talk about uh, learning, machine learning in the second phase of machine learning, I mean the, what I call the statistical phase, what you should all have in mind is this type of picture. So this is curve fitting. So you know when you have an experiment, experimental data, let's say these points here, any one of you did any, any, any experiment in physics in the first year lab of physics, you get data on, in, in a plane, x versus y, or y versus x, and you, you are asked to approximate it with a function, okay? So this is what we usually do. I mean, so you, if this is my data, I mean, uh, the, first, the first try is to approximate it with a constant. It doesn't look too good. So the, first, the second try is to, let's say, put a linear function here. This is the first thing that any, any physicist will try. A plus bare x. It, look, it doesn't look too convincing. Okay, so what we do, we go to higher order polynomials. Okay, so we get, let's say, two quadratic or third order, or maybe very, very high order polynomial. You know that in the limit, if I take the polynomial to be of the, the number of points, minus one or plus one, <laughs> I, I, I can fit all the data exactly. Okay, so that's great. I mean, I have a very nice model that will fit my data perfectly. So what's wrong with it? Hmm? It will not generalize. But how do we know? Okay, so, I mean, so what, what's wrong with this? So essentially, this is really the main lesson of, uh, of statistics or, or, or of uh, you know, the early phase of machine learning. You shouldn't overfit. Okay, you shouldn't try to move through all the data points because this will be too complex of a model that can make any sense. I mean, okay, it will be a perfect interpolation. I mean, any one of you who learn uh, numerical analysis, I don't know, sometimes so there was, you know, there are those Chebyshev polynomials that can fit the data perfectly with or is a perfect alternate and so on, but they get crazy everywhere else. I mean, they're, they're over-controlled inside my data and completely wild outside. There's no control of what happens to these high-dimensional polynomials. So this is what we call overfitting. And because we actually think about generalization, which is the error outside of my training, yeah, on the new data, so a new point here will, will get wild in general if, with this high-dimensional polynomial. Because, you know, they oscillate so widely between the points, that the chances are actually hitting another point. So if you look at this data, you know, you would actually say that a reasonable model is some sort of like, something like a, sin a sinusoid. I mean, there are two, two clear oscillations here, and the rest is probably noise. Okay, so that that's brings another, another very important point. So, so first of all, we know and we know rigorously from all sorts of theorems that if you really want to generalize well, the number of data points should scale like the number of parameters, let's say if it's a polynomial, is the number of coefficients or the degree of the polynomial, okay? So that's a rule of thumb. It should be a little more than that. So you, in order to estimate the parameters, you need a few more points to actually estimate them with some confidence. Okay, so that's the first rule of learning. The number of data points to scale is the number of parameters. Unfortunately, deep learning seems to violate this rule dramatically. I mean, we have millions of parameters and only hundreds of thousands of examples. This is really generally the case. So something is really wrong with our understanding of, of fitting. So curve fitting is not what deep learning is doing. 
at least not, not in a naive sense. Now you saw already that if instead of polynomials, I actually use a sine function here, I can actually fit this data very well with very few parameters, maybe just two, you know, the, or three, the, the amplitude, the phase, and the, the offset of something, I don't know. Uh, so this is a sine with two parameters, and the frequency, of course, yeah. So three parameters can fit it just as well as the polynomial very high degree. So the choice of the right class of functions in which we search for the approximation is very important. And that's something we, we usually call in learning uh, uh, the hypothesis class. So I want, I want to, of course, if this is too wild, for example, if I allow my sinusoids to be with unbounded frequency, so then again, I can, I can fit this data very nicely with one sinusoid with only one parameter. So something has to be, because you know, I can oscillate between the points oh, very, very, in very high frequency, and this will obviously Tell, it always tells us that it's not just the number of parameters, there's something else there. Okay, so, so before I go on, yeah, of course, deep learning also goes with, uh, with this notion of, deep, of big data. So we know that unlike uh, classical learning problems, classical learning algorithms usually have finite dimensionality in some sense, in the sense that I'm going to describe in a second. So they saturate eventually when I add more data. I mean, the performance doesn't improve with the data. Deep learning algorithms, this deep neural network, seem to behave like this. I mean, you add more data, you get better models. This is, of course, why adding millions of images or hundreds of millions of images seem to improve the, uh, the, the, the recognition of Facebook or whatever. And, and this is, there's a reason for this, because they don't really have a finite dimensional model, and they manage somehow to adapt the complexity to the data without overfitting, or at least without overfitting as much as we could imagine from simple models. Okay, so these are going to be the first questions we're going to answer or to ask today. And uh, so maybe before I go to the chalk talk, of the, because before starting to prove, prove, prove things and, and bounds, I just want to, to give you again the outline, the high level picture first. So, and then I'm going to come back to this picture again and again. So those neural networks have the following structure, essentially. So, and, and again, I'm going to open this, uh, this box a little bit. So maybe even before, before going into details of, of this, they have the following structure, the following fo form. So there's input or inputs, which are essentially, I'm going to call them xi unless otherwise uh, stated. So that it's, and those xi belong to some variable which I'm going to call, to denote by capital X. So that, those xi, things about them, I mean, for the rest of my talks, these are, let's say, images. They have, I don't know, 10 megapixels, images of objects, let's say faces. And my task is to recognize, or let's say to say even just very simple thing, is it me or not me in the image, okay? Is it a picture of me or is it not a picture of me? So essentially, the output of this black box is something which I call the label or Y, and in general, it's going to belong to, I'm going to denote by capital Y, the, 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 the variable from which this is sampled. Okay, and now the, we call it a black box because something very strange happens inside, and I'm actually going to open this black box. So essentially what happens here is that the input is mapped into something. So there is this y, which I'm going to put here for some, for some reason, which is the, 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 the desired label. So for every x, there is a y which tells me is this is my picture or not my picture, okay? So you can label pictures like this. So essentially there's some sort of a distribution underneath, p, x, and y, from which we actually sample our data. So I actually get, pairs like this, xi and yi, which are distributed according to this pxy, okay? So this is the way we usually learn. We sample this input distribution and then get a label for each one of them. And then something strange happens in between and eventually I get, let's call now this y hat, which is my real output of the system. The reason it's not y is because I, I'm, I'm not sure that y is y, this is what the system is going to generate. My goal is to get y hat and y as close as possible to each other in some sense, okay? But that's 
never happens exactly, it's going to happen in some statistical sense, and that's what, what we want to guarantee. And somewhere in between, in between this, uh, this, uh, this uh, something happens here. Let's call it T. Or there are those, or I'm actually going to use several no notations for this. I'm going to call it X hat, or sometimes I'm just going to call it the, the hidden layers, the set of hidden layers. So just like here, you see X, the data, which is sampled from this disjoint distribution of X and Y, I get a finite sample. It can be very large, but just a finite sample, it's usually much, much smaller than the poss all possible images or something like this, which is essentially infinite. And uh, I'm going to get this finite sample, so I'm going to get something like N samples here. Let's call it M samples here. And uh, those, uh, those images are going to go to a transformation layer by layer, which I'm going to call the representations of the data. So each of those hi, I'm going to eat some, some function of x. So essentially, what's happened here is some sort of internal representation, not all people like this term, which can be one layer or many layers, which are essentially telling me inside this box, the images are going to be scrambled and transformed in a very interesting way, which we don't really understand, but eventually they're going to generate this y hat. So this is the picture I want you to have in mind, and I'm going to use Essentially, an information theoretic in terms, I'm going to say, okay, you know, in general, t is a function of x, but even if there is some noise in between, if it's not really a deterministic function, maybe just a stochastic function, this is some sort of an encoding. So I'm, I'm going to use the term encoder for this conditional distribution. How is the representation, this internal representation, Representation, representation is going, is going to depend on, on t and I, I'm going to, for, for many good reasons, which I'm going to explain later on, think about it as a stochastic map. If it's deterministic, then it's a special case of a stochastic map. It's some limit of a stochastic map. So it, this can be stochastic either because there's some noise in the map or because I choose to look at it in a, in a, so think about it as, 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 as some sort of a many to one map. Maybe, for example, by interpreting the sigmoidal functions in the units as probabilities. This is actually what we usually do. We think about the units as probabilities of something. So it's probability of being one or zero or minus one. If I think about these arctangents, these hyperbolic tangents or, or, or this uh, sigmoidal function as a probability, then it's, although the, the network is deterministic, I can think about it as a stochastic map. Okay, is this clear? And then eventually, from this internal representation inside the box, which in the case of neural networks, of deep neural networks have many, many layers, and actually not one representation is a cascade or sequence of representations, and which are related to each other, I, I call this the, the, the decoder, which is how, how I actually calculate the output from the representation. So this is the picture I have in mind when I talk about representation learning. And towards the end of this, of this lecture, I'm going, I'm going to give a very strong statement about the nature of the problem in terms of the properties of this encoder and decoder. But actually, actually I'm going to use, so g given a representation, I'm not going to use the actual decoder of the network, I'm going to use the optimal decoder the one I could get if I, if I, if I was a god or had access to all the data. This is what I call, this is the base optimal decoder. So think about it for a second. If you have any representation, there is a map not from y, but back, not to y hat, but back to y, which is the best thing I can do. Now, one thing just about notation, when, when I write things with arrows like this, I actually use the graphical model, model representation. So this is a Markov chain which means that uh, x and y are related to each other in such a way that given x, I can calculate y. So maybe this goes in both directions, actually in this direction. But there's a, a mark of dependency here. So it's py given x, which really matter. And then if I have distribution of x, I know also p of x. Okay, so, so I have the joint distribution. So it's py given x, which tells me how the label is determined given the pattern. And x is, got, is something which I'm going to call the pattern, the input pattern. And I'm going to think about, okay, the map 
from the pattern to the representation, and then from the representation, what would be the best possible inference of the label given x? And this is what I call the optimal decoder, or the base optimal decoder. I'll come back to this uh, explicitly. And eventually, I'm going to state a theorem which tells us, look, everything that really matters are not, not even those encoders and decoder, but one function, one number, the mutual information of the encoder and the mutual information of the optimal decoder, which are going to tell us the whole story. So this is where I'm going. Now, usually when we think about learning, the issue is generalization. So what we essentially have in, in the, so I'm going to talk about pack bounds. And pack bounds are probably approximately correct bounds. As I said, I mean, the original due to valiance in 84, but uh, actually they go back in statistics uh, many years before that. Uh, and if you actually see the trace of them in Vatnik from 71 and, and even further. Now, uh, the pack bounds are talking about something which we call the generalization gap. So imagine that I have an hypothesis class. So I'm going to write it as is usually done. So age is a class of function. which can be, you know, that the polynomials, for example, of some degree, let's say, 10 other polynomials, or some uh, function with some bounded uh, Fourier transform, band limited function, or, you know, uh, any, anything else that you can, you know, function on a sphere which can be approximated by some uh, finite uh, number of uh, spherical harmonics, or whatever. You name it, as long as I can bound the complexity in some very strict sense that I'll talk about in a second. So this is a class of functions and, and age are functions, you know, from x to y. So let's say if y is just a bit, these are Boolean functions of x. And the pattern x is, is, is this, uh, so, you know, so for every, every x, let's say one of my examples, I can look at uh, the distance or the square distance, something like this, between how well my function is approximating the true label, and this is, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be a, a, a square distance, it can be much simpler things. Usually I'm going to move it to something which I'm going to call the error of age on xi. So it can be something like the square error, it can be the absolute value, it can be something else, or whatever I want. This is going to measure how close, we like square errors because it's easy to take derivatives and so on, but we don't have to. And uh, it's going to measure how close my age is approximating the label, okay? So let's call this the error, error of age on xi. And of course, it's a function of both xi and yi, okay? So now imagine that I have m examples, which are randomly drawn, and actually assume that they are independent and identically distributed. Uh, so they're randomly drawn from this joint distribution of x and y, which is somewhere there. It's part of the world. I don't have access to it, but I'm drawing. Them. So essentially, what we really care about is how well, or at least learning theory cares about, is how well I can approximate uh, my real error, which is the expected error, by the empirical error, which is the error on the sample. So let me let me write it carefully. So essentially, if I have independent samples, I usually like to sum my error. Okay, so this is going to be the sum of the errors on my sample. So I, I assume here that I have a size A, I, I'm going to denote it like this. I mean, so I have a sample, which let, let's just write it as, as x to the m, okay? Which is essentially an independent samples of labels and, 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 and inputs and patterns, okay? So, so this is the, the sum of the errors. If I want to see the average error, what would I do? You know, so the empirical average is one over m, okay? So this is the mean error on my, on my sample. Now, I, what I really care about is the difference between this and what? I mean, what, what do I really care about? Hmm? The expected error. I mean, you're not yet with me. I'm a little worried. So, so you want to, to average it with the expectation of this error 
respect to all possible ages in some op all possible x's, sorry, which I'm going to denote just by, by the expected error over x, error of age over x. Okay, so essentially the difference between this and this, and I want to bound the absolute difference. This is essentially the difference between the empirical error, empirical error, or, or sometimes we call it the training error. And uh, so this is the error on the sample. And this is the expected error, which means if I had all the data, this would be the expectation of the empirical error. OK? Is this clear? This is what I really care about, because I want to minimize the expectation. I want to find an age which has a small error on average on all the data. Sometimes I also want to minimize uh, the, the variance, but that's, uh, that's a different story. So this difference between the empirical error and the expected error is usually called in the learning literature the generalization gap. OK, let's call it gen gap, just because I'm out of space here. And uh, so, so this, is, uh, this is the difference between the empirical or training error. And sometimes this is actually called the generalization error. So I know that many of you know this, but, but you don't respond to my question, so I have to go slowly. <laughs> So essentially, this generalization error. OK, so how can I, what do I know about this difference? Yes? No, no, so look, OK, good. It tells me that I need to be a little more careful. So essentially, I want to keep this for a while, but so essentially, the story is the following. Let's say that this is the error, and this is uh, H. So in general, this is a multi-dimensional, high-dimensional space, but for lack of uh, many excesses on the board, I'm, I'm drawing it just as one line. Okay. Now, let's say that my rule is somewhere here. Let's call it H star. So actually, it can or it may or may not be in my hypothesis class. So let's say that h star is the closest possible function in my class to the data. So this is going to be the best approximator. Remember my, my points? So none of these polynomials really go through all the points. I, di I didn't care. I wanted a good approximation. In this case, I wanted a good approximation in the square error or something like this. This is what you do all the time. So let's say that the best approximation is h star. Now, if I look at the error, Outside, uh, so usually it will look something uh, complicated like this, OK? I mean, this is really a rough approximation. So this is the expected error on my data, which means this is the error average over all possible points, including this that I don't see, including the out of training data. That's very important. So usually, if my age is really the best approximate in my class, it will have the minimal error, OK? There may be, by the way, a lot of ages like this. I mean, actually, in my, in my complicated models like deep neural networks, I'm going to have a lot, infinitely many good models, all equally good, more or less. And we know that this is the problem. It's not one. But let's just for a second, at least think about one. Now, this, I could tell, so, oh, OK, so the problem is solved. I mean, just minimize the expected error and find this point in whatever have you. But the problem is that I don't have this function. Why I don't have this function? Because I don't have all the data. I have only a sample. OK, so, so again, I, I need to do something else. What, the only thing I can do is approximate this function. And I approximate it by the empirical error. Because this is something I know. So for every age here, I calculate the empirical error. So let's say I need another color. Let's say that the empirical error actually looks like this. Which is not, uh, actually, it can be much noisier. So this is the empirical error. Uh, let's call it 1 over m sum over e of h on xi. OK, so this is the empirical error. Why is it much noisier? Because it's a random sample. And some data, was, maybe I get zero error here. I don't know. It can be negative. But let's say I get zero error here. It doesn't mean that this is the best one. 
So now, what would I like to have? So this is really the fundamental property of, of machine learning or classical machine learning. I would like to do something that if I actually minimize the empirical error, which is something, something called empirical error minimization or ERM, I'm actually not too far for minimizing the expected error. So what I want is a guarantee that this is not too far from this. If this is not too far from this, let's say I get to this point instead of this point, they are close enough. So for this, I need something which we sometimes call uniform convergence or, or things like this. I need that the envelope, that these two functions are uniformly not too far from each other. Uniformly, I mean for all ages, I can bound the difference. If I could bound the difference, at least in probability, bound the difference, then I'm fine. Okay, so this is my goal. This is the goal of Valiant. I want to bound the difference between the empirical error and the actual expected error, and I want to do it uniformly for all ages. If it's uniformly bounded, I know that the difference between them cannot be too large anywhere, then minimizing the empirical error will not take me too far away from the actual best function. This is the main idea. Yes. If you're confused, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Okay. If you optimize H, right, then for one H you're gonna get the smallest difference, right? I optimize over H, yeah. Right. If you optimize over H, then you get one H that's consistent. But the picture says actually that you want to that you want to give the, the bound for all values of H. Yes, I want the bound to be uniform, yeah. So it's not enough. It's not for one H, but that's for all ages. That's right, so that's what I'm saying, for all ages. For all age, I want to, this is what we call uniform, convert, uniform bound. So what, can you, what can you optimize? Ah, then I optimize the blue line. No, but in your formula, if, yeah. if you want to do this for all age. You're, you're absolutely right. You're just preceding me. Let me, let me go slow. I, I'm, do, I'm going to do that. Okay? This is precisely the point. I, I want a uniform bound because I want this minimization of the blue function to be close to the optimization of the white function. But they're not the same function. So, for example, something which could be a disaster, that this is the white function and this is the blue function. It's completely uncontrolled. If it's completely uncontrolled, I can get this point here or this point here, and this will not give me a good generalization. Okay, so if I can put it in an envelope which is bounded, I mean, I, I know that I can bound the difference between the blue and the white uniformly for all ages, then I'm fine. This is what we call uniform convergence bounds. Okay, so this was the spirit, or is the spirit of learning theory. This, is, this idea dominates learning theory mostly until today. And I'm going to argue, or first of all, I want you to understand it, and then I'm going to ruin it. But uh, before, before I ruin it, I want to convince you that this is a good idea. Okay, so this, is called, this idea is called empirical risk minimization, or empirical error minimization, ERM. ERM tells me, look, if you minimize the training error and you have uniform bound on the, the difference between the error in the, the sample error and the actual expected error, then you're okay because this difference, I can actually bound this difference. This is, uh, can bound it exactly by some, the width of this, uh, uh, this tube of this envelope and, uh, and something and the error of the actual error. Yeah. So that's actually very easy, yeah. Uh, you're preceding me. Let, let, me. let me just a little bit further and then ask the questions. Yes? I just have a clarification. So since the, the number of functions will increase with the number of data points, so is this valid only for a small set of data points or like really generalized? No, no, no. This is true for any M. I want a, an M-dependent bounds. So essentially the question becomes a classical statistical question. I want to minimize the probability that this value is, let's say, greater than some epsilon. This is really what I want. If I could bound this probability to be too large, um, then I'm okay. Then I'm, I have this epsilon tube, and then I'm fine. Okay, so what is the probability? So now I'm using something which Beth mentioned and other mentions. This is an, an empirical average, and this is, this, it's expectation. You see this. If I average this over all, I just get 1 over m, the average, which is m, it's exactly the average, okay? m times the average and the m cancels, okay? 
So if I just take the expectation of this, this is this. Okay? This is clear. So now why does it why can I bound it? Yes. That's right. This is just like saying that with high probability, which I'll mention, this is going to be smaller than epsilon. Okay? Uh, absolutely. Then I'll minimize that empirical error, and I'll, I'll, I'm done. Okay? But first, I need to guarantee this. I want to minimize the generalization gap, and then, of course, I'll take an optimum over all ages if I can. Okay? Yes. This is the probability distribution over all patterns and the expectations with respect to the axis. Of course, we don't have all the patterns, but we have a sample. So this is like empirical Yeah, so we have the empirical. We have a sample of I of M patterns. I'm talking about the second term. Yeah, the second term is something we don't have. But I can still bound the difference. Why can I bound the difference? Under some conditions. OK, so in general, if, the, if I'm talking about a fixed age, one age, anyway, any age, the probability that this is that the empirical mean is close to the expectation, what do you know about it? So, so this is the, you know, the standard convergence of empirical means that was mentioned many, many times. Essentially, I know that this is a sum of uh, IID numbers, of independent numbers, because the x's are independent. And therefore, this is converging to a Gaussian distribution. I Bert just said it uh, very quickly. <laughs> And uh, this Gaussian has a width which scales like square root of n, square root of m, but if I divide it by m, it squares like 1 over square root of m. So the width of this Gaussian, so if I look at this empirical distrib the distribution of this empirical mean, it's going to look like a Gaussian around the empirical error with width, so this is over the samples yeah, of size m. Uh, with widths that goes like 1 over square root of n. OK, so that's very nice. This is allowing me to use something which we call the churn of bound. So if I want the probability that I'm too large, that this difference is more than epsilon, I need to bound the, the probability that I'm large is, is, the, is the width of the tails of this Gaussian. So essentially, if I take m for any epsilon, if I take m to be large enough, the, the, the Gaussian is going to concentrate around the mean, and I can bound the difference. So essentially what churn of bound or things like churn of bound, I mean, I'm, I'm smoothing some assumptions here that the error is bounded and so on, never mind that, is less than something which looks like e to the minus 2m epsilon square. How many of you are surprised by that? So this is uh, one version of the churn of bound. There are many, the coefficients can vary depending what exactly I'm talking about. One-sided, two-sided, how much I, I bound it. If I talk about the error in, two, in both dimensions of whatever. But, but this is the, the essence of it. And, and by the way, the fact that this reminds me of the, the exponent of the Gaussian, this is indeed the case. I mean, epsilon square is just the x minus mu square of the Gaussian. And uh, 1 over 2 m square is exactly the variance. OK? So, so this is just the abscissa of a Gaussian distribution at this point. And I want it to be small enough. And actually, it's a bound, if you don't know, on the tail. So this is a nice thing about Gaussian. The, the error function is bounded by the abscissa itself up to some constants. And, and, uh, and so this is a bound. This is called the churn of bounds. Now, I know that people think that they know it, but they don't know it. So I'm saying it explicitly. This is the fundamental bound here, and it's all it's all very simple. I mean, I have an empirical mean. I want it to be close to the mean. And I know that when m gets larger, this is going to shrink like square root of 1 over square root of m. OK, so that's very nice. Because this is independent of anything. It depends only on m and epsilon. Now, I want, OK, so but this is still a positive number. So I want this to be small. I want the probability that I am too far away from my mean to be bounded. So I'm going to make this smaller than some delta. OK, but that's not good enough. Why it's not good enough? Because this was just for one, one age. Well, what happens with other ages in my class? I need to bound all of them. I, so I need something slightly different. I need the probability 
probability that there exists an age in, in my hypothesis class such that this is true. The empirical error minus the expected error of age is larger than epsilon. I want this probability to be smaller than delta. This, this will be nice because this will give me this uniform convergence. I want that there are no ages in my class that are bad, which means that they, they, don't, uh, they, don't, they are not controlled. They have larger generalization gap than I want. OK, so how do I do this? So there's a very simple trick. I mean, OK, this is absolute value here. Yeah. Sorry, this is just a condition on, on this. So how do you? So this is the probability that H1 is not, good, it's not bad, and H2 is not bad, and so on. It's or I want or on, on many, many, uh, many, many events. So this is the probability of what we call, I, don't, I want that any age in this class is, is good. OK, so this is bounded by something which you call the union bound. So in principle, if age is finite, this is bounded by the cardinality of age times the probability that one age is not good, so times e to the minus 2m epsilon square, and this I want to be smaller than that. Now, what is this cardinality of age? This is a tricky thing. Yes? Yes. Such that the probability of that. Uh, yes, you're right. You're right, absolutely. No, uh, such that this is larger than epsilon, the probability I'm going to bound later on. It's all right. Uh, this is for a given sample. <coughs> so this is the probability of a sample. You're absolutely right. I have to be careful here. So but for a given sample, it's just a number. OK? So the probability of that for any sample, there exists one which is larger than epsilon. OK? So this is the whole trick. This is called the cardinality bound. And of course, it makes sense as long as my class of function is finite. OK, so this is known as the cardinality bound. Cardinality bound. And it's good as long as age is finite. But what, OK, and, and what I get from it is, is a very nice thing. I, I just take the logs. So I want this probability, that there exists an age which, for which it's epsilon bad on my sample with high probability. The probability is, again, because my samples are random, and I can have a bad sample or a good sample. Most samples are usually good, but again, I get a very lousy sample. So, so this gives me to take the logs, and you see something like this immediately, that epsilon square is less than log cardinality of h plus log 1 over delta divided by 2m. OK, this is simple algebra. I'm not going to do it here. Take the logs and rearrange. OK? So this is a very interesting bound. This is why people like it. Because they tell me, look, the only thing you really have to worry about is that the log of age plus this log of confidence, we call this the confidence. Confidence. So we want this to be small. I mean, what is this? This is the probability that I guarantee that my sample is not too bad. OK, so delta is essentially the probability I get a lousy sample. It can ha always happen. By the way, when I go to very large data or very large problem again, this probability is going to be negligible. I mean, the probability that I see million images of me, which is uh, not typical, is very small. I, I can forget about it. OK, so now I, I want to talk a little bit about this bound. Is this clear? Sorry. Yes. This number, I mean, this was a union bound. So this was a sum over all ages. Uh, okay, I skipped one line here. This I can bound by the sum over all ages in age, uh, in, in principle, because this is what we call the union bound. Union bound, which means I'm approximating the probability of a union of events by the sum of the probabilities. OK, so this is true if they're disjoint, but if they're not disjoint, it's a bound. OK, so these are, these are not disjoint events in general, so that's why it's a bound uh, of this number, e to the minus 2m. This is because this bound was true for any age. 
But this is simply the cardinality. This is simply the cardinality of H, e to the minus uh, 2m epsilon squared. And this I want to be smaller than delta. OK? So this is it. This is the proof of the theorem. There's one, one, one problem here. Oh, OK, so that's, that's actually very good as long as my cardinality, the, oh, somebody asked me, what is the cardinality? So essentially, it's the number of functions. So obviously, if, let's say I talk about polynomials. So even with uh, constants or with one first order polynomial, it's not a finite class. OK? It has two parameters. So somehow, I need to do something else. And this is uh, what we call the covering or the quantization of the class. So instead of, uh, let's say, if, if, age, if age is finite, then that's a very nice bound, well behaved. I'll show you that it's useless, <laughs> even as it is. But uh, if, we, if we have an infinite class, so for infinite, infinite uh, 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 ages, what we do is we, 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 do, we use a very important trick, which is called an epsilon cover of H. OK, so what I mean by that is that imagine now that H is a compact uh, manifold. Uh, it, it's it's compact, a, a compact space in Rm. So, so if H is compact, and I, I don't want to get into too much of the mathematical details here, which means, yes. Sorry, I can't, I can't hear. If 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 age is infinite, this bound is useless. Okay. But uh, yes. No, no. I I I actually didn't say it explicitly, but it was assumed here that this sum is finite. Okay. But of course, if this, fine, if this sum is infinite, then I cannot use this bound. I mean, this is going to be log of infinity, and it's not going to tell me anything. By the way, you see here that this bound becomes meaningful when m is, is larger than this cardinality of h. Forget about delta. So essentially, it's the log of the cardinality of h over m, which is going to dominate my epsilon. I want it to be small. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Now. If h is infinite, this is not a useful bound, but there's this nice, very nice trick that if h is compact in the mathematical sense, this means that for any epsilon, for any epsilon cover, I can find a finite cover. So let's say that h is a, a two-dimensional manifold there somewhere. So this is supposed to be a piece of a two-dimensional manifold. It's a compact means that it has a finite cover for any epsilon. So let's say I want to cover it with spheres of size epsilon, what, no matter what this metric is, as long as it's a more or less a metric, so the number, so this, the size of, this, of this, uh, each of these spheres is epsilon, which means that within this sphere, the difference between the arrows is bounded by epsilon. So essentially what it means that the, this epsilon or this metric is the probability of disagreement of two hypotheses. So the, my metric here is that the h1, h2 is the probability that of the, what we call the symmetric difference of h1 of h2 under my, under my rule. So under my whatever probability of my data is the probability that I find the point where, where these two are disagree. So this is the symmetric difference. So if I have, let's say, uh, if my hypotheses are, let's say, images in the plan, and one is inside and, and zero is outside, this is the symmetric difference. This is the place where they disagree. This is H1 and this is H2. OK, so the probability of disagreement is a very natural metric here. OK, so in principle, such a probability exists. I don't even need it. I can just talk about how many epsilon spheres or epsilon balls like this I need in order to cover my space. Now, many of you may have heard about, let's say, the house of dimension or the dimensionality of a manifold. So in general, what we know that if the number, let's say, the number of spheres that I need of size epsilon to cover my space scales like 1 over epsilon to some dimension. So in one dimension, let's say this is my manifold. How many spheres I need? Essentially, 
1 over epsilon. In two dimensions, as you, I hope, can imagine, you need 1 over epsilon squared. So this is the dimension of the manifold. Yeah, so this is the dimension of the manifold. The dim of the manifold in which H lives. Now, OK, so it can be the dimension of the parameters, for example. It can be the dimension of some other smooth embedding of my hypothesis. OK, so that's an interesting concept. So this is, this is very much, uh, let's call it the topological dimension. So if, this, well, if, if there exists a D like this, when epsilon is very small, so essentially D, D is really the limit of uh, epsilon goes to 0 of a uh, log of uh, n epsilon divided by log of 1 over D. One, yeah, 1 over epsilon, sorry. Uh, and if this limit exists in some sense, then this is a finite dimensional manifold. At least it has a finite household dimension. And, I, and actually, this is good enough for us. I mean, this dimension can, in other contexts, it's called the VC dimension. It's very closely related to it. And so yeah, yeah. So the VC dimension is something very similar to this, although it, usually it's introduced in a much more complicated combinatorial way. But D can be the VC dimension or the household dimension. House of, uh, and so on. I mean, there are many, many other types of notions which are all similar up to some constants in the exponent. Yes? The epsilon, the epsilon cover is related to the epsilon. No, it, it is related. Yes. So actually what I want is to replace this by the cardinality of an epsilon over 2 cover. And then, then I, 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 if this is finite, then it's enough to find one of the elements of the cover and use it as your function. And then the error is going to be bounded by epsilon square, and another epsilon square I lose from there. So I want another factor of 2 here, maybe, to, to, do, to have an epsilon here. So if this is epsilon square, I'm fine, actually. So there is, you know, I just cover my space by sphere of size epsilon 2, take one of the closest one in this cover as my hypothesis. This will give me at most epsilon 2 error, additional error. So I bounded the other one by epsilon 2, and I get an epsilon approximation. So that's good enough. OK, so that's the whole trick. I cover my hypothesis class by, I do what we call quantization of the hypothesis class. It's a finite quantization, therefore I can use this, this cardinality bound. But it's going to be a function of epsilon. So if it's going to be a function of epsilon, let's say that it behaves like a 1 over epsilon to the d with some constants. So the constants, uh, I don't care about constants. Because eventually, I'm going to take m to be very large. And I'm going to, uh, so there are some constants, which are geometric constants, I don't care. I replace this by 1 over epsilon, or, or 2 epsilon, let, never mind, to the d. Or 2 over epsilon, sorry. Let's say 2 over epsilon to, be, to make Bert happy. So, uh, so this goes, again, like 1 over epsilon. 1 over epsilon to square, but this is nice. I'm sorry, it's the log of this. It's the log of the cardinality. The cardinality goes like 1 over epsilon, the log of the cardinality. But this is very nice. Why is it nice? Because this, then I have a bound which looks like epsilon square is less than d, or d over m, or whatever. d over m plus constants, which looks like 1 over delta and things like this. And 2m here, OK. So this is going to be dominated. So the d goes from the exponent outside. And I'm sorry, d over n log 1 over epsilon, yeah. d log, log of 1 over epsilon or 2 over epsilon. It really doesn't matter. As you see, I mean, we don't really care about constants here. Because we're already thinking about very large problems. But uh, if you really want the constants, uh, work them out. OK, so this is my bound goes something like this. And this is nice, because it tells you that m, the number of examples, should scale like the dimensionality of my cover, of my class. So it's d over m. As long as m is smaller than d, this is not a useful bound. Once m is larger than d, this becomes a useful bound eventually. OK, so this is the nature of learning theory of the pack bounds. How much time? Yes, 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 yes. So it tells me that if m is larger than this over epsilon square or something, then I'm fine. 
I mean, you have to work out the logarithmic correction here. It's not, it's not, it's not important. OK, this took me t way too long, but it's important. So now I'm going to argue that when you think about neural networks, the dimensionality of the parameter of the class, I mean, with all these weights, is in the is orders of magnitude about the number of examples. This is a fact. OK, so we need to do some refinement to this bound. Or we need to think about different things. I'm actually going to argue. Notice, by the way, that what is the hypothesis class is extremely important here. So I'm doing it in a distribution-independent way. I don't care what the distribution of the data is. It's out of the game. But I do care very much about the dimensionality of my hypothesis class. I mean, what kind of functions I'm looking for. So now I'm going to do a 90-degree twist to this type of bound. OK, so this is pack theory. This is it's actually very elegant, and that's why it's really dominating the, the story so far. Any, any questions of this? I'm going to erase it. Yes? It's the dimensionality of the number of functions. Exactly. Right. So it's not the number of parameters in your network. Yeah, but now, if you think about the weights as parameters of the function space, yeah. so the possible number of, way of networks is uh, having a dimension which is bounded at least by the number of weights. Bounded, bounded, bounded by. Yeah, but I thought your argument was going to be that the number of parameters is actually much larger. That's exactly right, but uh, okay. you don't see it yet. So if, if I replace D by simply the number of parameters in the network, as I said, the number of weights between all these layers is going to be way too high, and these bounds are useless. They are in the stratospheres, I usually say. I mean, they are way above one. <laughs> okay? So we need a, a new argument here, and, and that's exactly what I'm going to do now. Well, that's, this is what I wanted to do now. But before I do this, I need some, uh, I need some concepts about concentrations, I need to clarify some of So this talk is, is ma mainly introductory. I see already that I'm not going to get too far by 6.30, but let me try. So when I say pack bounds, that's what I mean. Now, So no, notice that really the, the, the main, the main uh, idea in this bound was this concentration of, of empirical means. It's, it's the churn of bound, which is something we're going to use again and again. Yes, please. I, I can't hear you. Charles. Yes. So the edge function, so think about the network. What are the parameters here? These are all those weights. I mean, all the connections between one layer to the next. These are all adjustable parameters. So in principle, the number of parameters of these models is at least, as, as Beth said, is, is bounded by the number of weights. In practice, it behaves like a much lower dimension. So let's try to see why and try to estimate this dimensionality. But, but the only mathematics that I can use is the mathematics of, uh, of large systems, I mean, of uh, large scale learning. So when I, when I say large scale learning, just a second, I'm coming back to you. Large scale learning, this is a topic uh, of many lectures that I give in a course in Jerusalem. I'm going to summarize it very quickly. <laughs> yes? Yes, so, so, so again, I mean, this is a, an interesting trick. We are not thinking about x at all. And, and, and the only way where x comes into the game is in the distance measure. It's the probability that two, two h disagree depends on x and depends on the distribution of x. But once I, as I, I define this uh, distance between, between two hypotheses as, as, as this uh, probability of the symmetric difference, then I don't care anything about h. It's the distance on the edges. And this is what we call covering or, or, or quantization of the hypothesis class. I'm going to shift it to a different type of covering. Uh, it's covering of the input class. And that's, that's your question is actually very relevant for that. Yes, another question. Yes. Uh, if you don't wish to answer this one, it's fine. But I, 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 I try to answer every question I get. Yeah. Do you 
no, I, I don't have to do this because there's a central limit theorem that tells me that this is going to be Gaussian in the limit. It's not an assumption, it's a mathematical result, okay? As long as E's are bounded uh, and independent in some sense, okay? Or well behaved, have finite variance, that's enough for me. Okay, yes. So if, if you're talking about uh, simple functions like polynomials, then, then this d, this dimension, is going to be essentially the number of parameters plus minus one or something. So the, the, the next point then is, if I get the intuition, is that you're using an overcomplete basis of functions? Yes, you are using a way overcomplete function. But it's so overcomplete that the number of parameters doesn't make any sense anymore. Okay. Yeah, that's essentially what's happening here. Now, OK, so I guess you are more or less happy. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and I want to talk about, so we need some me mechanisms, some, some mathematics that allow us to control the behavior of very large systems. It's not new. It's called uh, physics, statistical physics. Uh, it's, uh, it's called uh, in engineering information theory. Uh, these are all theories which are asymptotic in some sense. And I just want to give you some intuition about it. So imagine that my xi's are distributed I idea according to some distribution, P of X, just to make it simple, OK? And uh, now I'm having a, an, an M sample, an IID sample, M IID sample, again, as, as, as before. And uh, I look at the probability of, a, of all the samples together. OK, so what do you know about it? If they're IID, what is that? No, I'm trying to get to the point where everyone answers together. Yeah. OK. So this is the product. OK, this is the one of the actions of probability. The probability of independent event factorizes, <laughs> multiplies. OK, so this is a product over, write it here. OK, that's a, a very fundamental thing. By the way, it, it will be true in a much more general setting. But what do I know about product of IID numbers? Hmm? Nothing. <laughs> no, but what I do know is that sums behave very nicely. I know that products, uh, oh, products. Are. So first of all, this should be all non-zero. So I want to assume that it is strictly larger than zero. Otherwise, if I have one zero here, it's going to nullify all my product. That's not very nice. <laughs> so uh, of course. The assumption is that if you saw xi, it doesn't have a zero probability, because otherwise, but you know, when you talk about uh, continuous measures, it becomes tricky. So, so essentially, uh, this is uh, the assumption here. OK, so if, it's, if they're all uh, positive, and I want to actually turn it into sum, what should I do? Yeah, good. OK. And I, I want to see at what point you really all understand. OK. So I take the log. If I take the log, this is turning into sum, OK? But now what, what do I know about sums of independent things? So I just said it. I mean, they, said they concentrate. So they concentrate around what? Around the mean. So this is going to look asymptotically like m times the average of this number. This is the advantage of physicists. Average are very easy to write. <laughs> OK? Why m? Because again, I mean, for the same reason. So actually, it makes perfect sense to take 1 over m here and 1 over m here. And since this is a negative number for, for, for normal logs, uh, I put a minus here. OK, for the same reasons we talked about for this measure concentration thing of independent sounds, this is going to concentrate. I have to be a little more careful here, because these are not, no longer bounded numbers, and I have to do this averaging carefully. But let's say that I, I can, can control that. So this is very nice, because it tells me that the log of the probability of a large sequence of events is going to concentrate around this mean of log. Let's call it mean, minus 
min of the minus log, whatever it is, with a spread which again go like 1 over square root of n, up to some similar assumptions. I have to control the magnitude of these probabilities, but that's not an issue. OK, so again, it's going to be a Gaussian distribution for the same reason. OK, so that's very nice. So it means that in the large m limit, this is going to be centered around this particular average. OK? Now, what is this particular average? So this particular average is simply the expectation of minus log of p of x of all possible x's. How do you write it otherwise? It's minus sum over all x's, or integral over all x's, I don't care, log of p of x. OK? This is what it's going to concentrate around. OK, but you probably know this expression. What is it? This is what we call the entropy of x. Yeah. So the entropy of x is a very useful thing. This is a definition, and it's called the entropy, or the Shannon entropy. OK, so the entropy of x is going to dominate the, the, the probability of a very long sequence once the sequence is very, is very, long, very long or very, very large. Yeah. OK, so that's very important because essentially it's telling us telling something which in information theory we call the asymptotic equipartition property, but it's never mind. It's a very complicated name for something very simple. So it's telling us that in the large L limit, again, this, uh, if, I, if I put some epsilon here around the entropy, the probability of finding sequences that are far away, far, further away from epsilon is going to go to zero where, uh, with m. So put an epsilon on the tails exactly as, as I did before, and this is going to concentrate very nicely. So actually, I can say very clearly in the same way exactly that the probability that 1 over m, or minus 1 over m, log p of, of this large sample, allow me to write it like this just to, to save space. So, so xm is this, OK, just for simplicity. Uh, so the probability of this minus the entropy of x, the probability that this is going to be larger than epsilon is bounded by something Exponential in epsilon, or something, maybe other constants here, but I don't care. Something like this. This is, again, the chain of bound or the central limit theorem. OK, so that's very nice. It's telling me that for large enough m, this is going to concentrate a lot. So, OK, so, so this is a very interesting property of this number, the entropy, which we can actually calculate explicitly just if you know the distribution. So this empirical log likelihood or log probability is going to be attracted very, very sharply to, to, this, to this particular number. And now I can restrict myself only to what, what I call typical patterns, typical sequences. So this is important. So in some sense, I want to make this sufficiently small, this state is sufficiently small, such that I don't care anymore about path, sequences which are out there. I call them non-typical. So, Essentially, I can uh, define a set of all possible sequences such that, so it's all the sequences, a set, OK, whatever. It's all the sequences of size m such that this is true. Uh, so, so log p of m, 1 over m log p of m minus h is less than epsilon. OK, so again, it's a, there's a magnitude. OK, this is the condition of the sequence. Sorry, x of m. OK? Yes? Can take down the, 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 can take down the monitor? Ah, the monitor. You can take it wherever you want. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. So I, the, I usually have a board that I can lift up. Yeah. OK, yeah. So. Uh, so this is, uh, this, is the, this is what I call epsilon-typical patterns. 
Okay. Why epsilon? Because there's an epsilon here. And what is really nice is that when m goes to infinity, I can shrink epsilon. Very much like this churn of bound again. So for large m, for large scale problem, most of my patterns are going to be typical. Actually, there's something even nicer here. It tells me that the probability of the pattern, whatever it is, is essentially e to the, or 2 to the minus mh. So all the sequences in this class have the same probability, essentially. Because all of them, this is very close to epsilon. So within plus minus epsilon here, you have to be careful. It has, it has, uh, it has this, uh, this probability. So all of them are equally likely. So now I'm going to apply it to my neural networks. This type of ideas, I'm going to do it very, very quickly now, because I'm out of time. So I'm going to essentially use information, this entropy typicality uh, to characterize the layers of the neural networks. So when I say large scale problem, I, 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 I'm going to restrict myself to typical axes. Typical axes means, okay, out, out of the, all the possible images of, one, uh, of 10 megapixels, I'm going to ignore everything that you would ignore, which are non-typical. So if I have a very distorted image of me, and you don't recognize it, I don't care if the network, the network doesn't recognize it. If it's a non-typical image, forget it. Okay, so I'm going to do everything that we did so far, but only on typical, on typical patterns. And I said that when m is very large, this is a good assumption because I can bound both epsilon and the probability of not being typical very, very easily. Okay, so essentially the same line of idea, the same idea exactly, can go to probability of two distributions of two variables, sorry, x and y, or condition distributions. So essentially, this is, this is going to be a very useful tool, and I'm going to use it in order to bound the cardinality of all sorts of things. OK, so let me, let me start doing it. So again, I need, I need a little more of information theory, but I'm out of time. I was hoping to get through it. So the first one is the KL divergence of two distributions. So usually I don't even spend time on it, but here I really want you to understand. And I see that it's actually working. So uh, I just want to motivate this scale divergence a little more. You heard about it already, I'm sure, even here. But this scale divergence actually is actually an extremely important quantity in this asymptotic setting. So for this, I'm going to just take a very simple example, which, is, which, which I'm going to generalize into something called Son of, Son of Theorem. So imagine that I have a binomial distribution, Bernoulli trials, coin flips, okay? And I'm asking, what is the probability of seeing m, m heads out of n trials? Okay, just in a binomial distribution or in Bernoulli, what is it? Yeah, all together. It's n over m. What? So let's say that theta, p of head, is theta. Okay? And p of tail is 1 minus theta. And theta is between 0 and 1. Okay? So this is theta to the m, 1 minus theta to the 1 minus m. Uh, n minus m. Right? So this is my probability of seeing m successes or head 10 tails where probability of a tail of a head is, is, is theta. So I'm going to see n minus m tails, and, and that's exactly the probability. Why is this, uh, where is this binomial factor coming from? I assume you know. OK? Now, what is really interesting, that the log of this, and again, it's, it's a very simple exercise, but I want you to do it, is actually behaving like, OK, the log of the n minus m, and n over m, uh, plus uh, m log theta uh, plus 1 minus uh, my minus uh, n minus m, sorry, n minus m log of 1 minus theta. But just using the fact that log n factorial, so this is n factorial over n, n factorial times n minus n factorial, so log, and log n factorial is what approximately? <laughs> 
it's, it's known as the ceiling approximation. Essentially, all I need is this. Now, if you don't believe this, integrate uh, 1 over x uh, and get log. OK. So uh, integrate log, and you get this, x, x log x minus x. Lan, yeah. so, so this is a, a natural log now. So uh, using this, this is equal approximately. And the only approximation here is the ceiling approximation, which is actually very good. And ceiling approximation is 10% correct for 4 and 1% correct for, 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 for 8. So it's really very good. Even without the prefactors, the, the n over e over 2 pi or whatever that you have there for the integration, this is a very simple thing. So if you just plug this here, you get, and I'm not going to elaborate here, you get e to the minus n, the KL divergence between the empirical distribution, which is m over n, and n minus m over n. So this is a binary distribution. n theta and 1 minus theta. So this is an exercise. I want you to check it yourself. OK? So that's actually very nice. It's exactly the only approximation here is the ceiling approximation. Now, what it's telling us is something which I'm going to generalize and use later on in several places. This is telling us that the probability of seeing an empirical sample which is far, far away from the expected, and the expected distribution here is theta and 1 minus theta. This is what I expect, let's say. And I actually see m and n minus m, or m over n and n minus m over n, which is this empirical distribution. So this is the empirical. And this is the expected. And you see that this is exponentially dominated by the KL, by number, by number, one number KL divergence, where the exponent has this prefactor, the size of my data. Okay, that's actually, this is another concentration result, which is telling me that the probability of seeing an empirical distribution far away from the expected is decaying exponentially with the sample size, where the exponent is dominated by this distance between the empirical distribution and the expected distribution. Some of you may recognize an approximation to this, which is known as the high square distribution. It's essentially the observed minus expected over expected square or something like this. Observed expected over expected, which is essentially just an approximation to this. First order approximation to this. So usually when we want to see how likely an empirical data is to come from this particular hypothesis, we look at the chi square. That's what most people do. And what they should do, they look at the KL divergence. Now, this is a, a very special case of something which I want you all to remember, which I'm going to call Sano theorem. She's essentially is telling you, by the way, let's say that I didn't know theta. So let's say that theta could come from some sort of domain of possible theta. So that's anything between uh, 0.4 and 0.6. Or what is the likelihood that it came from a theta between 0 and half, or whatever, something like this. So then this is going to be dominated for large n again, for n is very large, by the smallest exponent. And everything else is going to be negligible because of that. So even if theta here belongs to some uh, subset of theta, which is uh, uh, some subset of all possible theta, even if, by the way, if, even if this is not a convex set, there's an issue of convexity which always comes here, but I don't care about it at this point, this is going to be dominated by the point in my class which is closest to the empirical distribution as possible because this is going to be the smallest exponent. So there's going to be some sort of a theta star, theta star here, where theta star is the thing which uh, minimizes over all possible theta in my, in my positive class, in, in my class of parameters, uh, this scale between the empirical, let's just call it p empirical, and the uh, p theta. OK, so this, this is essentially sum of theorem, telling you if you have a, a possible class of models or hypothesis class, everything is going to be dominated in the limit of large n by the point closest to my data in my hypothesis class. And everything else is not important. So this, uh, this in some more, more careful uh, 
uh, more careful formulation, just to, to worry about things a little more careful, is always true for empirical distribution, even if it's not Bernoulli. Even if it's any general distribution, any general class of hypothesis classes, it's all dominated by the KL divergence. So the KL divergence, this number, which is non-negative, and it's true. So the distribution within an empirical distribution in any class of function is exponentially dominated by this number. It also has many other uh, interpretations, like code length difference and so on. I don't care about them at this point. I won't. I care about tunnel theorem. I'm going to use it. Now, the, so the KL divergence is not just a measure of similarity or distance. It's really dominating the asymptotic probability of a, path, a distribution or an empirical distribution being further away from my class of parametric distribution, which I care about. So you see immediately the relationship between KL and the question we asked before. Because we do care about the distance between our empirical data and a class of possible functions. And what I'm going to argue is it's going to be dominated by the minimum in this class, everything that I care about. Now there's some very important special case of KL divergence, which is known as the mutual information of two variables. So if you have a joint distribution of x and y, like my input and output, then the KL divergence from the joint distribution and the product of the marginal is actually telling you something about dependencies. So this is going to be 0 when? When they're independent. When the product is the same as this. Otherwise, I can write it in various ways, but the important thing for me now is that it's the entropy of x minus what we call the conditional entropy of x given y, which is the entropy of x conditioned on y. So it's the same thing when I condition on y and then average over all y's. So this is actually very interesting. So the KL, the mutual information, is how much uncertainty about x I lose when I know y. Or how much uncertainty of y is removed, uh, of x is removed when I know y. Now I'm going to use this. Now, mutual information is very important for all sorts of reasons. We're going to see it. Today was really very slow, but never mind. I have four more hours. I can do a lot more. So there are two properties of the mutual information which I want you to remember. One of them is called the Markov, uh, the data processing inequality. That for any Markov chain, which means y can com be computed from x and z can be computed from y and so on. So they have these arrows, just like the, the, the arrows of the, of the, of the neural networks, the, the layers of the neural network. The information cannot increase. So the information between x and z cannot be larger than the information between x and y. And it cannot be larger than the information between y and z. So this is, this is known as the data processing inequality. It's actually very intuitive. I mean, you can't gain information if you just process. So I can't gain information about x when I move from one layer to the next. And I can't gain information about y either, because y was to the left of x, if you remember, in my chain. And another very important thing that I'm going to mention today, yes, uh, next, tomorrow morning, very, very uh, in detail, uh, remember that this mutual information is independent. I mean, this is a special case of data processing. If I have a reversible transformation, any permutation or encryption or whatever you want, it's not going to change the mutual information. So for example, if I give you encrypted images, they all look like white noise. And as far as information is concerned, it's not different from the image itself. But of course, neural networks have a hard problem identifying it, unless it breaks the encryption zone. So this is something which is going to tell us that something about mutual information is not enough. We need more than mutual information in order to actually characterize the, the neural networks. So what I'm going to do now, just as a to prepare you for tomorrow, I'm going to show you this movie that uh, became very famous if you follow YouTube. So essentially what I do here, and then I'm going to discuss this, this, uh, this movie in great detail tomorrow. So it's, uh, it's actually explain what's going on. So if you look at the, at, the, at the neural network in terms of mutual information, we have this chains of inequalities. The information about x can only go down when I move from one layer to the next, because there is this uh, Markov chain. Okay, so data processing inequality tells me that this, this this mutual information can only decrease, and this mutual information can only decrease as well because remember, y was here. So the further I go, the further I am from the desired or true label. 
So I'm going just to give you a, a promo of my talk tomorrow. And my main talk is going to explain to, in great detail what you see here. So this is a numerical experiment, which is what I call the information plan. So what you see here is the information of layers about the input. I call them T here. It's just like, remember the representation I call T. So each layer here is, here is in a different color. This is, in blue, you see the layer closest to the input. In yellow, the next one, and orange, the next one, and so on. The last hidden layer is this in orange. Now, this is a very specific network. I'm going to argue that this is a very general picture. I know that a lot of people argue with me about it. It's generally in the sense that I'm going to explain tomorrow. But what you see here is this story of information plan. The coordinates here are the mutual information that the layer has about the input, what I call the input, the encoder information. And the abscissa here is the mutual information that the same layer has about the output, which is the decoder information. Now, I'm going to prove a theorem tomorrow, which I call the information theorem, information plan theorem, but I wanted to show, so this is the initial condition of the network. I mean, what you see here is randomized weights. Gaussian distribute, Gaussianly distributed around zero is some width. Okay, that's the way we usually initiate neural networks for very good reasons. We're going to discuss it. Different initialization are going to, to look different. This is a, a, hyper, a, a sigmoidal neural network, but it doesn't matter. I mean, the same, the same thing happens in, in other networks. And it, it doesn't matter at this point how I estimate information. I'm going to talk about it more. I just want to show you how it behaves when you train the network. Okay, so this is, a, this, is a, this is a basic motivation for the rest of my talk, trying to understand what's going on here. So essentially what I'm saying is that, uh, well, so what you see here is 10,000 epochs of backpropagation, which is this stochastic gradient descent. And you see that during uh, the first 300 uh, epochs, more or less, let's say about 300, all the layers went up especially the last one, and they did it rather quickly. This is something which I'm going to associate it with the drift phase later on in the, in the Fokker-Planck equation. And you see that the data processing inequality still, still remains. I mean, the first hidden layers, layer has a lot of information about the input and a lot of information about the output, essentially one bit, which is all the information. But the, the, more, the, the other layers lose information. The last hidden layer, at this point, about around 300 epochs of training, has about 0.6 bits of information about, about the input. By the way, when I say bits, you know what I mean. I mean, it's the units of entropy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is about 0.86 bits. One bit is the full information here because it's a binary law, one bit, yes or no. And about four or five bits of information about, about the, the units, about the input. But from this point on, we see this very strange thing, which we saw for the first time, and I really jumped when I saw it. You see that it takes a long time, up to 10,000 epochs, for the last layer, which is really the important one, to reach essentially one bit. Then I know that I'm okay. I have one bit of generalization. I have all the information about the label. So it did it by this very funny trajectory, which I'm going to discuss in great detail tomorrow. So essentially, this is the average of those plots of those spheres, and you see that from A to C, it went up and a little bit to the left, which means it gained information about the label, but it also gained information about the input, all the layers. And then from C to E, they did this very slow, you see this, the trace becomes very dense, which means that the time step is small, is uh, dense, and you see that uh, eventually the last layer from C to E converged to a good point in the plan. Now, there are many, many questions you should ask yourself when you see this, this, uh, this movie. One of them, is this the general picture or this is just a very special network? So I'm going to tell you that it is. The second, one, the second question, all of those are going to be discussed tomorrow. What is the meaning of the mutual information? I mean, what this I, what, what is this ITY actually related to generalization? I'm going to prove to you very easily that it is. It's a very sharp bound on generalization error. But the question is, what does this mean? I'm going to prove to you by modifying the pack bounds that ITX is actually controlling the generalization error very much like the dimension. That's really not IXT, it's 2 to the IXT which really controls the dimensionality. So there's something completely different here. Instead of covering the hypothesis class, 
I'm going to cover the input class. That's, that's the exercise tomorrow. And then, okay, so what do they mean? And then the question, the really interesting question is why these values concentrate? I mean, so I have very different, very different networks here, you see at this point. But you see that for all these different initiators, by the way, everything is randomized. The, the initial condition is randomized. The examples are randomized. Everything that I could randomize, we randomize here. And you see 100 repetitions. And they look very much concentrated in this plan. Now, when you see concentration, you understand that there's something about this large scale limit which seems to push them together. This is what in physics we call good order parameters, like magnetization of spins or like whatever what we use in, 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 in statistical physics all the time. So things that come to concentrate in the limit are very important. And you see that these two information values concentrate very nicely. So we need to understand this, under what condition this will happen. And of course, from what I showed you about entropies, you already, of course, pixels and image are not IID in most cases. <laughs> They're highly structured. There's a lot of connectivity, a lot of uh, mutual information, or a lot of uh, dependence between different pixels. But still, somehow, the log probabilities are going to concentrate. And that's something very important. Once we understand the concentration of these measures, we can prove the, the, main, the main theorem, which essentially the story of the learning and the representation of the deep neural networks is described in this plan. In terms of what the encoder and decoder are, and then we are going to talk about the dynamics, the SGD dynamics. Why does it look the way it looks? Okay, so I'm finished for today. Thank you very much.